Hey there, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Cisco Chat Live. I'm Todd Brannon. Um, I lead up product marketing for our cloud infrastructure and software group here at Cisco. Um, I am super stoked to be back. It's kind of like getting asked to host SNL a second time. Um, I'm going to be your guest moderator for this week's chat. We're going to talk about all things hybrid cloud infrastructure and operations. But before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you know, we're going to be taking your questions live um, throughout the show, answer them as we go, and at the end of the show, so post those questions out, you know, if you're watching on Cisco.com, uh, if you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or just hit us on the Cisco chat hashtag on, on Twitter. That might be the easiest way to reach us with questions. I've always wanted to say this. Mash that like and subscribe button if you like what you're seeing, you know, depending on the platform you're on. Um, so we got a, a fantastic panel here to hit this uh, today. So by way of introductions, um, you know, my first uh, panelist here almost needs no introduction, right? He's the founder and principal analyst uh, over at ZK Research. He covers this industry end to end, top to bottom. The one, the only, Zeus Caravallo. Zeus, welcome. Hey, thanks, Todd. And uh, right. it's uh, like being an SNL host, is no talking Dogecoin, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want to tank anybody's stock here in this conversation, for sure. <laughs> um, now, the next up here on the lineup, right, he's, he's kind of a big deal. He's the driving force behind all of our architectural vision on computing, computing architectures. He's uh, the director of our cloud and compute product management team. Uh, his name is Vikas Ratna. Vikas, welcome. Thank you, Todd. All right. And then finally, uh, we've got someone here that's going to really kind of hit on some of the, the most interesting new developments in what we're doing in the stack. He's a uh, leader of our cloud and compute uh, product management team for all things Cisco Intersight. Matt Ferguson, are you ready to Cisco chat, Matt Ferguson? <laughs> I'm excited. It's been a wild week. We've had a lot of uh, announcements, and I can't wait to talk about them. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks for joining in here. So, so guys, we're gonna we're gonna really traverse a pretty broad shoreline here, right? We're gonna go. We're gonna start, you know, down in the physical server layer. We're gonna talk about abstracted infrastructure in the middle, you know, VMs, containers, and this conversation is gonna go all the way up to serverless, purely serverless computing and microservices. Because that's really where we see all the innovation, you know. But if we if we kind of zoom out as we get started here, it, it's got to be with this understanding that. We're in a cloud first world. I know we've been saying that for years, but it's it's really it's really starting to happen where you know we talk to customers that are cloud first, cloud only, um, born in the cloud, you know, just that's where they live. That's where they started. And then we've got a lot of customers that are largely still on prem with their IT operations and they're happy that way. It's working. They just want to be a little bit more cloud like. And those are kind of the two extremes. But in that big middle ground, most of our customers are trying to stitch, you know, monolith the microservice. They're trying to connect their on prem. Uh, operations to the things that they've got going out in the public cloud, and and it's not a trivial undertaking, right? So um, that's really the focus of what we're trying to do here. That's why we're talking about here on the Cisco chat. And um, Zeus, I want to I want to kind of open it up with you because you've got the widest lens on all this. You know, your vantage point in the industry. <clears throat> what do you see going on in this hybrid cloud space? You know, kind of you know, looking at fairly closely at computing, but but for broadly, and then we'll we'll kind of go further up the stack later in the chat. But what are you seeing? What are you seeing around computing architectures as hybrid cloud really takes root in most most IT shops? Yeah, well, first I I do think that um, the definition of cloud sometimes gets skewed towards public cloud, mm -hmm. right? And when in fact you know private cloud and has been here and is here to stay. In fact, some of my data shows that and. You know, just in 2017, only 18% of all workloads were run on private clouds. Today, there's 25%. So that, that's almost a 40% you know, increase in the number of workloads on hybrid cloud. More and more, as cloud matures as well, um, you know, we're seeing the big compute vendors roll out their own private cloud stacks, right? And so if you ask them why that is, they say, well, because large enterprises want it. So I think initially, um, um, uh, you know, a lot of the adoption of cloud is with smaller companies. But as it's gone up market, organizations have um, some needs, uh, you know, that are unique in the area of data sovereignty, security, better control, things like that. And that's driven towards private cloud. <clears throat> now, from an infrastructure perspective, the difficulty for organizations in private cloud is that we've, <laughs> you know, the industry has done such a great job of disaggregating infrastructure, right? We used to you know, think about what a server used to be. It was a box that had everything, all the memory and storage and stuff you need in it. That's but right. That wasn't a very efficient model. We couldn't really run private clouds that way because 
you know, if you, you'd, you'd be just spending tons and tons of money on in infrastructure. In fact, if you think back to, you know, 10 years ago, the average utilization, you know, server utilization was like 30%, right? And that's, yeah. that, that's, you know, the whole concept of cloud is to get better resource utilization. So, you know, companies like yourself have done a great job of disaggregating infrastructure, but now the difficulty for companies is how do I put all of those components together in a platform that works? And that's why, you know, some of the innovation that Cisco's had has been so important because it's, uh, you know, companies want private cloud, they want the benefits of disaggregated infrastructure, but they don't want the complexity of disaggregated right. infrastructure. How do you put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? I mean, yeah. and, and you're right, like, virtualization started out as a play to, like you say, you know, extract more, or, you know, get more workload packed on to fewer CPUs because power, you know, remember Paxville processors back in the 2000s, I mean, power and cooling hit a wall. And so virtualization yeah. kind of gave us a way to pack more infrastructure, get more mileage out of those watts that you're burning. But then it became an operational construct and the whole world pivoted to how do we manage a virtualized, a virtualized infrastructure. But you're right, things are getting more uh, decomposed. I mean, I think, and, and Vikas will talk a little bit about this too, but you know, we've, we've successfully peeled apart storage, networking, um, you know, accelerators have always been a separate kind of subsystem and servers. Um, and then on the horizon, you know, whatever, three to five, maybe six years out, we're gonna start seeing memory start to get pulled apart from the CPU. And, yeah, the beautiful thing is you got all these subsystems and you can put them in pools, but you got to have something to sew them back together again. And it's got to be like an automatic transmission. If it adds complexity, nobody's going to touch it. Like that's been the big, well, it's a, that's it's been a, my sense of composable so far, right? It's just too complex. It's a, it's a simple math problem, right? Like if you have one variable in an equation, it's relatively easy to solve, right? And the that was the old server model. You had one way to deploy it. If you have 10 variables in an equation, it's 100 times, you know, it's an N squared problem. It's 100 times more complicated. Exactly. And so... You know, I'm not telling people to go back to that old model by any stretch because you can do so much more with infrastructure than you could ever have done before. Uh, but it is more complex, and there are a lot more variables to deal with, a lot more you know levers to pull and knobs to turn. And so this is this is where you know we need some sort of way of simplifying that deployment so companies can have the ease of that single variable without the complexity of of multi variable. I think that's a great way to look at it because it is mathematical, something especially if you're operating at any kind of scale. Operating yeah. any kind of scale, it can get get away from you really quick. <clears throat> All right, because I want to bring you into the conversation, but I'm going to do it with an anecdote, right? Um, keep this interesting. So when I was about 10 or 11 years old, this would have been, I'm giving away my age, but like 80, 81 kind of time. Back. My, my grandma, Betty, bless her soul, um, she sat me down and she said, Todd, you know, there's something important you need to understand about life, and I want you to never forget this. And what she said to me was, good hybrid cloud starts at home. I swear to you, she saw the future, um, and she understood that if you can't, if you don't have that foundation on the private side, you're never going to be able to build out to the hybrid side. So, because talk up a little bit, you know, yesterday we announced really the follow-on to an epic, epic platform, which was UCS Project California, right? Back in 09, everybody was pretty shocked. Cisco got into the computing business. We saw a different way to maybe attack the problem, Project California. Here we are, whatever, 11, 12 years later, rolling out yesterday, X-Series, I've got the shirt. Um, our next generation modular platform. Tell the audience kind of what we're doing there, how it helps them, you know, stay out of the business of trying to build private cloud by themselves. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Todd. And that was a good context setting um, on the complexity, you know, that we see here. By the way, um, happy 10th birthday, Todd. <laughs> uh, that, that was a great context setting in the complexities the enterprise face today as they try, try to assemble the cloud first strategy and bring in the private cloud home first, because you need to have cloud experience at home before you get to the common operating model to have the you know, workload here and there. Okay. So building onto the same similar philosophy, you know, Todd, as we adopted a decade ago to transform experience when the virtualization wave was kicking in, we see the need of foundational innovation to arm our customers to have a successful deployment strategy in the private cloud. So if, if you really think about um, what, what will really unlock the power of private cloud or, you know, or, or simply put the hybrid cloud infrastructure, which is all about operational simplicity, agility, and application first architecture, the three things that needs to happen, the most foundational core innovation layer of the compute. First and foremost, compute needs to be engineered with hybrid cloud or private cloud operating model in mind as first class citizen. 
no retrofitting. Yeah. But that means is it should expose the interface and the primitives from the core layers to let hybrid cloud management platform or private cloud management platform manage it like a true cloud asset. This is where we co-engineered X series with Intersight, our hybrid cloud management platform. So X series powered by Intersight is built ground up to support this hybrid cloud operating model, no retrofitting in there. So that's the first pillar. The second thing that we uh, continuously see and uh, and then we get surprised about that the foundational innovation has not happened and this is where we are you know trying to solve that issue is compute needs to be designed with application first in mind. Yeah. Computer most of the compute architectures of today, as Jules was also highlighting, they need to move away from the rigidity they offer to the applications instead of having applications fit into the constraints or the boundaries of the box. They need to allow applications to define and dictate the constructs the applications need from the underlying infrastructure programmatically. Unbox, if you would. And this is where, with the innovations in the core computer architecture, the compute fabric, IP in ASIC, platform software, it, what is, it is what engineering is giving us the ability to have applications define the constructs need. We so, are so. Let me, let me let me let me let me try and I, I want to make sure we hit that point. So, so when you say primitives, when you say subsystems, what is it about how you architect at X series that allows customers kind of access that that level of the architecture, right? Tell, tell, or maybe framed another way, what are the changes you see coming down the road in some of these subsystems in computing that's kind of driving our philosophy here? Like, what are what, what do you see happening at that subsystem level that that we've got to be prepared for and, and how to stitch them all back together. Uh, 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 absolutely the right question to ask, Todd. So um, applications, are evolved. applications are evolved. Their numbers are evolved. Some applications need more memory. Some need more GPUs. Some need you know, more cores. Some need more drives. And what we see in the ecosystem is those components are also dramatically changing. So on one hand, you have applications evolving. On the other hand, you have technology ingredients just picking up the pace in terms of innovation, the GPUs, the fabric, and all those things. What we are looking forward to is coming together with an architecture which solves with those two ends. While it makes simpler for applications to define the infrastructure they need, but also it at the same time, it enables our customers to absorb those technology as they arrive. So you, you need to have you know, sort of unbox approach where you bring in the components that are needed by the applications incrementally and let the applications define what they need to run, to run their you know, desired business outcome for, for, their, for their requirement. Now, now I, you know, I, hear, I hear a lot about the fabric interconnect technologies that are coming down the road, right? We're on PCI today, we'll hit PCI five and six down the road. CXL, right, expressly. Talk a little bit about those high-speed fabrics and then, you know, what what did you do here with X series to pre prep for that, right? Because those are the fabrics you got to be able to sew it together with a with a really ultra low latency fabric, right? So, so what are we doing there? Absolutely. So uh, a decade ago, we uh, we introduced what we call as the unified fabric uh, uh, thought, and that transformed uh, the way the traffic flowed inside the compute system by converging the storage traffic, network traffic, and so forth. Well, the times have changed. Now there is a need for a newer category of uh, fabric where the low latency traffic can flow. The traffic that, that the latency that is needed by the GPs of the world, accelerators of the world, the memories of the world, where the PCIe class of traffic can flow, the CX Compute Express Link traffic and you know uh, class of traffic can flow. To address that, we are introducing a new X fabric technology, and this X fabric technology is a completely back panelless design. It fits right inside the chassis. It's completely user, user invisible. There is no cable coming out and it lets the compute node get access to those accelerators very, very you know, uh, in a transformative way. You slot it in, you define the profile and you get access to that. The cool thing about this start is typically when you uh, ch change the generation from PCIe four to five or you know, go to a newer class of the fabric, it's a complete system rehaul. Here, yeah. you just change those two fabric modules and you have transformed your chassis from PCI Gen 4 to 5 to 6 and so forth in the future. 
Uh, so I'm very excited about this new fabric that our engineering has given us to enable the newer e class of use cases that were previously not possible in, in you know in, in the contemporary architectures. So I, I think you just made a, a critical point, right? Which is we're entering a, almost kind of like we're going down the river. Things have been kind of a slow, you know, windy river. Kind of reminds me of tubing down the Frio or something, right? Kind of slow windy river. But things, are, the pace is starting to pick up in computing architectures, right? We're going to see rapid advancements in these low latency fabrics. We're going to see all the, uh, you know, components like accelerators, F, you know, FPGAs and GPUs start to start to accelerate in terms of evolution. And if you're not built ready for that, you're you're going to find yourself in a tough spot sometime. You know, you, you want to harvest that innovation. You want to take advantage of it. If you don't have a way to do it, you're 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 going to be at a disadvantage. So, awesome, awesome. Thanks, Vikas. So, yeah, guys. Uh, so, uh, I'll let you finish it out though. So, so other elements of the architecture. You're thinking forward. What else did we do here? You know, bring it home on X series. Yeah, sure. So, so the other thing that we want to make sure is this platform is feature ready on multiple dimensions. There are high watt CPUs that are coming in. There are liquid cool CPU SKUs coming in. High bandwidth uh, fabrics are coming in. This chassis has been designed with all those factors in mind, with the power and cooling innovation, with no IO backplane design, with X fabric technology, with the modularity that brings in. It gets our customer ready for the next decade of journey as those incremental technologies arrive. This is the platform combined with X series. This is the platform to simplify our customer's journey into the hybrid cloud deployment or the private cloud deployment. All right. So we so we kind of set the stage, Matt. I'm going to turn the guns to you. Um, we we've got we built the you know because so cloud is not about infrastructure, right? Ultimately, you're abstracting that all away, um, and you want to get to pooled resources. So we're kind of building that with X series in a big way. How do we pool resources, sew them together to the needs of the application, very cloud like, but we're still talking yeah. infrastructure, right? Yeah. Um, what we're doing, you know, talk to the audience. What are we doing around Intersight, infusing platforms like X series? What we're doing in our in our systems portfolio? How are we fusing that with the hybrid cloud operating model that you see? Kind of further. Yeah. That. No, Todd. Look, I mean, it, it couldn't be more exciting to be at Cisco and, and and really start now moving up the stack like you're talking about, right? Abstracting some of that hardware, um, and then and then moving towards that application. But Intersight. You know, look, look, let's talk about Intersight for a second about what we're doing, because when we talk about cloud, we a lot of times think about cloud as a destination. All right, I've made it. I've made it to cloud. I'm done. That's really not what we're saying, and that's not what we're thinking about. That's not part of the strategy when we're building Intersight. We're thinking about an operating model. Because the complexity, we just talked about a tremendous amount of innovation. We talked about a tremendous amount of complexity when it comes to the different modes of, you know, the hardware innovation and where we're going with software. Intersight now simplifies a lot of that. So now we're taking that, that complexity, we're distilling that down and we're putting the tools and the capabilities into Intersight as a platform to manage that for our, our IT ops teams. And we think about our, our guiding principles when we build Intersight, because it, it, it really comes down to three main things when we think about um, how we build Intersight. We're really talking about how do we automate, right? We talk about cloud scale. I think we've hit, hit the limit of human scale, but now how do we take that to the, the, the next level with cloud scale, where we take automation, where we take infrastructure as code, when we take all that capability, and we put that into a tool, into a platform where you can really sort of leverage that cloud scale. But then we then we now think about, okay, now I've got a lot going on. I've got a lot of pieces that are moving. You know, it's all these cogs are sort of rotating and I gotta now, I gotta look into, I have to have that observability. And I think we've been in an operating model where it's great to have like, red, yellow, green and alarms going off, but that's really visibility. That's sort of showing that something might be happening or occurring. Observability takes that to the next level. It now gives that, that, that context of that full stack potentially, all the way down maybe to the compute layer where, you know, Vikas was talking about the X series and the memory, the CPU, and, 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 but also now goes up that stack to give that meaning of potentially what may be occurring. Uh, resources, it could be optimization, it could be a number of factors we bring. And then 
the last gliding principle that we've been talking about when we think about Intersight is, is that that cloud native world, that shift in app development, where we now have to think about that innovation cycle, that engine of, of software and dev and the teams that are moving faster, agile, CI, CD, all the terms that you've heard and we know about, but how do we now think about a platform that works in that environment? And that's what Intersight's about. So, so Matt, I, I know we've got some new services that we that we, we kind of announced yesterday, but before you kind of talk to those a little bit, I think you just hit on something really important, which is open source and all the tool chains. And I want to bring Zeus, if I can bring you back into the conversation for a second. Um, you know, you see a lot of vendor strategy, you see, you hear, you know, a lot of customer strategies, right? But are customers looking for like one ring to rule them all, one platform to rule them all? What, what, or, or are they content to try and glue things. I mean, what, what are customers trying to do from a tool chain perspective? Because that, to me, that really kind of is the, the biggest problem I see customers struggling with, right? Is how do they bring it, the tooling together? What do you see? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's not exactly an easy question to answer. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think what, what customers want is the freedom to use multiple tools and vendors, but they do want a single control point. Mm. And unfortunately, the way the industry has been built is Everyone's got a single pane of glass, and everyone's got a you know single dashboard and things like that. But but that just leads to swivel chair management. And so that I do think more and more though companies are starting to realize you don't have to have best of breed everywhere to have best in class performance. And you know sometimes that integrated experience can matter, but not no one vendor can provide everything. And so I, I think in the past and. You know, a legacy data center, you might have seen something like VMware's D center be used as that control point for you know virtualization, but we don't really have that in the area of hybrid cloud and um, you know multi-cloud, right? There's not a platform out there that you can really argue with a single control point. So I do think there's an opportunity there. So I think I think that's what customers need is that is that that platform to plug tools into so they can use vendor X and vendor you know Y or whatever, and it'll all work together. Because that we can talk all we want about, you know, infrastructure interoperability and stuff, but you know, if you can't manage it, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what good it does you. So right now, what we've done is we've offloaded a lot of the integration of those tools to people, right? And yeah. so we, so there's a lot of human integration that's taking place, and I think. Um, you know, this is where the, the industry still needs to mature. And you know, it, look, we're very early in the cycle of hybrid cloud, right? Still, you know. You know, is really being mainstream for you know the primary compute model. So I, I understand how that goes, but uh, this is something I think where the the industry does need better innovation. I, I think you summed it up really well. It's it's kind of a it's a gray area, right? And and Matt, as you think about yeah. Intersight, right, is like a home base um, in some ways, uh, especially with cloud orchestrator, right? We're kind of creating a home base yeah. for other automation tooling to yeah. click in, right, for customers that. Want you know, maybe they're familiar yeah, I, with UCS, Hyperflex, they love Intersight, and they, they can use this as their home base, right? So I, I actually like that as the role. I actually like that as the long-term vision for Intersight, right? It, it should be that control point for the data center, it, it, you know, for the for the uh, uh, hybrid multi-cloud. It, you know, it's, it's got all the, the hooks into a lot of the cloud providers and things, and it's got full stack observability, as, you know, you guys were talking about before. And I think that's a sort of a good way to, to, to think about what the long-term vision of that product could be, because you, we do need that kind of single control point. So. Yeah, and, 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 you know, we, we're taking that, you know, you, you, you touched on it, Todd, the, the one, you know, of the three new services in Intersight that we are announcing this week is the cloud orchestrator element of it. And, and if you tie back to the strategy of what Intersight's about, right, it, it's, it's not only about, um, you know, automation, but now we're, we're, we're deploying a stack, a software stack on prem. And we have to do that at a scale that, that we have to have these workflow and we have to bring the best of breed tools in the industry. And, you know, if you want to use Terraform, you can use Terraform. If you want to use Ansible, you can use Ansible. And if we can pull that all together and then what we ultimately do know where cloud is going, we talk about hybrid and I think we sort of go, all right, well, that's on-prem and that's public cloud. But we're also talking about where your clouds are residing, maybe in your on-prem. It could be at the colo. It could be at the branch, right? Yeah. So, or it could be way far, far down at the edge. 
So we've taken that span of control, that human scale element, and we just distribute it across even your own pro private clouds. With, and, and this is where ICL sort of connects them all together and brings a lot of that automation that we need to do um, across all those various clouds. So, so let's be real specific, right? So, yeah. so just to make it real for folks, right? You know, ICO, it's kind of a low code, that's a buzzword now, but it's a GUI drag and drop. We've got some predefined workflows in there and whatnot, but as an example, can I use ICO to kick off a Terraform plan that's gonna go go work on something outside of the domain of things that UCS manages or uh, Intersight manages directly? Is that yeah. something? Right. Well, so yeah, to bring it home, I mean, let's let's think about, you know, standard human interaction with deploying infrastructure. And a lot of times we use the buzz term infrastructure as code. And, and really, at the end of the day, what you're doing is an API call. So what it, ICO does is it takes those API calls and puts them into various tasks for you. And it could be as simple as I'd like to set up a LUN for storage. It could be as complex as a, a layered approach of the way I'm going to deploy those VMs on a particular set of infrastructure. So we can package that up in a low code, no code, GUI based, or if you have a dev or an SRE team that's very comfortable with GitOps and really, you know, doing it via the CLI and having that, you can also interact with either Intersight or Intersight Cloud Orchestrator to, or look, to look at the various JSON code that, that is part of the workflow that you've created. So that's, it's awesome. very exciting. Awesome. All right. So, so let's go one click up. Well, actually, I, you know, I, I think of, of Intersight Cloud Orchestrator, that's kind of a, almost like an orchestrator of orchestrators in some way. All right. Or an orchestrator bit. of other tooling, right? Yeah. Um, let's go one click up the stack. Talk about, um, you know, we heard from a lot, particularly our customers, service providers, right? Um, they're building out big containerized environments, um, large enterprises, they're really going in all in on, on containers. And my observation, and, and ZUC, jump in here, but it, it is that people are still encapsulating containers inside VMs almost as an operational crutch. I, it, what, Zeus, is that, is that valid? Yeah, I, I hate that model, actually. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I think that, you know, that, that is completely a comfort thing. It's like, it is. Uh, you, all you're doing is you're abstracting one layer into another layer. And the whole idea behind containers was to make workloads a lot more agile and ephemeral. And I, I guess it gives the server operations people a little more comfort to know that they're running the container in the hypervisor. But to me, that's you know to your point, it's it's a bit of a crutch and it's it's sort of a, a needless step. And I and I am seeing some move away from that now, especially once you get out into you know edge computing locations where you know your processes you don't have as much compute power as you do in a data center and things like that. So I, I think we're learning some lessons there that um, we can't just you know over provision. <laughs> Our, our servers and our, our processors to the point where we can handle abstracting an abstraction layer. And, um, and, and I do think you'll, you'll see a, a move away from that, but right now it's, it's done, um, you know, pretty commonly. And, and again, part of that is the tools people have are set up for virtualization, not really set up for containers. So they yep. can use those tools and kind of backdoor their way into managing it. You know, we, you know, the, the ser you know, service provider, you know, I've heard folks like they're, you know, and they understand that the ultimate destination is going to be probably bare metal containers, but they're kind of in that midpoint and they don't want to pay VM licensing fees to encapsulate a container, right? It kind of, yeah. they not, not only are you shooting yourself in the foot from a kind of an abstraction and, and performance perspective, yeah. you're paying extra money for it. So talk about what we did with workload engine to hit that, to hit bare metal containers, take, you know, talk, take us through what we did with workload engine. Yeah, so this is another area that I'm, I'm very excited about with, with what we're doing with Intersight and the Intersight Workload Engine. We're taking a, a platform, a next-gen platform, and we are managing that, delivering that, lifecycle managing that from Intersight to be able to have a platform that you can deploy your containers, you can deploy your VMs, you can deploy your containers on VMs, you can deploy your containers on bare metal. So you have that capability. And again, back to you know, the complexity, you can then manage and you can also deploy, whether it's at the colo or at the far edge. But really this, this next, next gen architecture, this platform of workload engine is about having for those dev teams or those SRE organizations that are familiar with containers on VMs, 
we'll we'll have that hypervisor built in for you. That'll be a part of that that stack. But if you want to, and you are down at that far edge, you got to squeeze that operational complexity down to its minimum. You might have some performance. You might have some, some specific app profiles where you want to deploy that container directly on the operating system. Workload Engine will also be able to do that. And then we've engineered Workload Engine to work in our hyper-converged, you know, you know, hyperflex, you know, uh, 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 hardware. So, so we now bring the compute, the storage together with you know workload engine to pre provide that lifecycle management of of all that software that's a that can be a complex burdensome task for operations for even sre teams to sort of manage and, and own so we take that off so we can deliver that and we can we can manage the the security profiles the cves the you know the the various elements that are all dispersed across so that we can we can manage the servers, the clusters, and the workloads all within that um, Intersight and workload engine uh, construct. So it's it's a very exciting space. Um, it's an area that I think lends itself to a lot of very, I think, uh, use cases where we talk about now the application. Now we now the operations team isn't solely focused on managing the stack, but they can sit back a little bit more and look yeah. with observability and automation about the performance or the element of the application, which our line of business owners really are, want us to really focus on because that's where the value, that's where the, probably the majority of the revenue is coming from, from our customers. So if I read that back, it kind of goes back to another saying I've heard that I love is, uh, you know, friends don't let friends build their own private cloud right and and that and that's at the you know and, and there you're talking about clustering you're talking about you know the operating system hypervisors or bare metal so what i'm hearing you say is we're kind of pre-engineering that for folks and life cycle managing it from the cloud with intersight if you want to operate across cloud you got to operate from the clouds so so workload engine kind of an operating system hypervisor bare metal containers all that you can blow it down onto hyperflex manage it from the cloud and like you say Look further up the stack, lift your gaze up to, you know, across the horizon to what you really care about, which is the workloads on top. Let Cisco worry about that, that underlying platform. Did I, did That's I get it. that right? Yeah, right. no, Todd, you couldn't have, you couldn't have said it better. And, and I think, uh, you know, this is a, this is an area that, that I personally find, you know, really exciting because, you know, now if we, if we take that, you know, uh, that uh, enterprise, you know, hardening, of that software stack and then integrate that and this is where i think some of the aspects of where you know this isn't a separate product off to the side that now i've got to figure out how to bolt it into intersight wait a second you know do i have to do a bunch of configurations to make it work you know that's that's where i think the the element of an integrated platform like intersight brings this all together and goes it works you know you deploy it here's what you'd like I now can visualize it. I can now observe. I can now have all the, the other elements of Cloud Orchestrator. I can bring it all together. And, and I can also bring my own open source tools when it comes to automation. If I'm a Terraform shop, I can drive Intersight. You know? So th those, are, those are, I think, pretty, um, you know, back to the heritage of, heritage, of, heritage of Cisco, we are about open standards. And that's, yep. that's, that's also a sort of a driving factor to this. Way back in the day, MCLS, yeah, I, I the, the fact that Cisco, the Cisco just hired a head of open source, I think was pretty interesting as well. That's right. So, exactly. I, I think um, historically Cisco has been accused of being, you know, a little uh, closed and proprietary, but I think what people missed though is you support every open standard that there is. You just have other ways of doing things. And so the, especially in the compute space, you've been, uh, you, you know, you've really embraced openness for since you rolled out the product. I'm great. I'm, I'm really grateful you mentioned that, Zia. So, um, yeah, we, we're really excited. We got Stefan Augustus coming on board. He's going to be head of open source for Cisco, and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, kind of, he's going to rally us right around what we're doing here. So, Zia's kind of coming back. Uh, you know, I want to I want to go all the way up to the top of the stack here. Where we've talked about composability in the physical infrastructure. We've talked about orchestration. We've talked about how do we simplify the the, the underlying kind of platform effect. But the world is going microservices. The world is going serverless. What are you seeing? Talk to us about it. Uh, well, it, it is going. Uh, 
you know, microservices. And I think one of the, especially if you look out in the future, you know, the, the, the definition of cloud has changed right before our very eyes, right? It used to be a lot of centralized workloads, uh, but now when you move to this distributed computing model where you bring in private clouds and, uh, and especially edge locations, mm. um, we're putting more workloads in more places. And uh, as I had mentioned before, a lot of those edge computing locations, they, you just, you don't have a, a data centers with a processing capability there or storage capability, right? So the workloads there tend to be a lot more ephemeral in nature. Like you want to spin up a service, not as a permanent workload, but as something that runs for, you know, 20 minutes or 20 seconds. And then you want to deprecate it just as quickly. And this, you know, when you think about the, the old world of virtualization, you would spin up VM after VM after VM and you'd never kill them off. And then you wind up with, with your server running a whole bunch of workloads that they're, they aren't doing anything except you know chewing up compute power. So in, in this world of distributed cloud, we need to be a lot more thoughtful about how we consume our resources. And I think microservices and containers are the way to do that. And it, it actually <clears throat> fundamentally changes app architecture because now you, you wind up with a lot of um, um, apps that are built uh, you know directly by accessing microservices from different um, you know, from different cloud providers and in different locations, consumer apps have already moved to this model. And, I, right. and I think in, in the enterprise space, we're just starting to catch up. And uh, it's going it, to, it, it really kind of has a profound impact on the way IT is run. It makes it a lot more network centric because it's kind of the glue that ties those things together. That's the whole concept of the service mesh. Yep. And um, um, so I, I think it's, uh, it's it's here to stay. If again, it's going to allow us to do a lot more than we could ever do before from an app development perspective. But it does, if we're not careful with it, can raise the bar on complexity yet again, and um, you know, it can cause us to have be an environment that's difficult to manage. Right? I, I think you're spot on, and, and I'm seeing that same kind of trend. Like in the, in the large enterprise, they see the just the advantages from a life cycle, like an application development life cycle management perspective of decomposing into smaller pieces. Um, and they're figuring out, okay, how do I refactor a lot of these monolithic apps that I've already built um, with kind of the folks out on the bleeding edge being those cloud native folks or maybe building things from scratch, like you say, on the consumer app side. Um, but it's definitely, so So Matt, um, yeah. you know, we, we've got all these containers with little services running in with, within them and really the network becomes the back planer. The network becomes the computer if I want to get my Scott, you know, McNeely on, but, um, <laughs> you know. It was just uh, there, it was so, a few so, decades so, too early on that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm revealing my age yet again. Um, but, but so, so, you know, application service mesh, let's go slow. A lot of folks in the audience probably, you know, kind of heard about it off in the distance, or maybe they're intimately familiar, but start with, with what is an application service mesh? What is it? Yeah, boy, Z, I think you guys were, were really spot on. A lot of the, you know, we go back to the change in the development of an application was very monolithic, right? We had, um, you know, all in one, we broke that out into microservices. A lot of times we put those on a VM, right? And then we, we, we understood that, that paradigm. We, we, we knew it. We knew the networking. We knew where it was. It was, it was pretty static. They popped up like popcorn and, you know, never left. But microservices, to your point, may go up, may spin down, they may, they may horizontally scale, they may vertically scale to meet the demands of probably the user or at least whatever the line of business. So when we talk about application and networking, a lot of times we think about, in the Cisco sense, an IP network. But really when we're talking about application networking, what we're talking about is that that's the underlying, that's the underlay, that's really you know, probably pretty static, not necessarily gonna move a lot. But with these microservices that are popping up, what we need to understand is the communications between these microservices. Now we're at the API layer because that now we want all the things that we're used to at the networking layer, but we want to look at that abstracted layer above it, that application layer. We want to understand what are the API calls? Who's calling what? Are they allowed to do that? Are they secure? Uh, then, then it opens up a number of interesting use cases because we can now think about, well, an application has a life cycle itself. So do we now think about load balancing? Now do we think about potentially canary upgrades where I might have a, a version one, 
But you know what? There's this new capability because we're agile, we're CICD, we're moving fast. There's this new capability. So I have a version two of the application. So how do I though not cut over and pray and hope for the best, but I do the canary where I do the rolling. And this is what Service Mesh Manager does. These are all these capabilities in the microservice container Kubernetes world that while it might seem foreign, I think, to a, uh, maybe a network person or a Cisco person that's really fundamentally involved with IP networking, but a lot of it's kind of familiar. We're now just dealing with applications and how they're talking to each other and how we, we roll and drain traffic, maybe. That might be a networking term. Drain traffic off of a, a, an application. But really what you're doing yeah. is at that application layer. So, so it's a, it, it simplifies some of the harder aspects though, and this is where I think when we're talking about software, again, there's lifecycle management, there's security, there's there's CVEs and how do I deploy it? And then, then is my job as an IT ops or SRE to just manage that? I mean, I've got to, again, focus on the application. So we take that burden, we lifecycle, we deploy in our case, first part of our service mesh will be Istio. And anybody who's played around with Istio knows that it's pretty complex. It can be pretty hard. So we simplify that installation and we lifecycle that managed for you. And then we provide all those tools and to solve those use cases in order to simplify how you do the operations of those application um, networking uh, part of what Service Mesh does. So it's it's exciting. All right. So 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 audience, right? Keep us honest here. Keep the questions coming in. Um, you know, we had a couple questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna strap back to what Vikas was talking about for just a split second. Someone asked a question: When's when's UCS X series gonna be orderable? The answer is right now. So X series is orderable now. Come and get it. Um, and then we had a question from Courtney out on Cisco.com. Question: X series sounds composable. Can you comment on that, please? Um, absolutely composable. Um, that's what we're talking about: breaking down subsystems in the server and sewing them back together. Uh, but doing it the right way, doing it with a with policy based model like like Vikas was talking about. So a couple questions and some answers there. But uh, in the announcement yesterday, Matt, kind of swinging back here, we announced a new component in the Intersight portfolio, uh, kind of an add on or an extension, if you will, an extension to our Intersight Kubernetes service. You know, we kind of scan the industry. There's a lot of service mesh technology out there, like anything in cloud native or open source. There's a ton of variety out there, but we scanned around. We found a, a company, we, we liked them so much, we bought the company and that was Bonsai Cloud. And uh, talk a little bit about their, you know, what, what we saw in that and, and how that's expressing itself now in this new service that we announced yesterday. Yeah, so Bonsai um, had a number of different products that we're excited to start uh, introducing. And in, in this concept of what we're saying is an extension to our Intersight Kubernetes service. So we'll be, taking um, a lot of that technology that Bonsai brought to the table, and we're gonna be adding that to the Kubernetes cluster. So now you start seeing this layering of software where we have maybe a hypervisor, we may have the Kubernetes cluster, we now may have you know, the service mesh manager, we're now at a lot of different software stacks and a lot of, you know, integrated open source components, a lot of, you know, uh, developed components organically within Cisco. And we're doing a lot of that lifecycle management for our customers. And then what Bonsai brought to the table is the fact that you can now visualize the complexity of a mesh and you can then, you know, operationalize the aspects of that application networking that we talked about earlier, so that you can do this load balancing, you can do these canary uh, upgrades, you can do the security aspects of, is this encrypted you know, application, application API communications? Can I enforce the policies? And some really cool stuff, can I look back in time? It's great, I know it now, but can then I look back in time to see if anything happened? Can I see the health and performance of those API calls? Is it slow? Is there some service level objective that I, I want to alert on? And so there's quite a bit that Bonsai brought to the table and I'm pretty excited that we're going to now extend the Kubernetes service with adding Cisco Service Mesh Manager to it. Awesome. So it's all about visualization, right? You, you can't understand how to operate something if you don't see how it's all connected together. And and. And there was a question that came across on one of the platforms 
you know, what about serverless architecture? Uh, this is from Joe Dane. Uh, what, what about serverless architecture that exists in this platform? And what I just heard you say is a resounding yes, Matt, that we are full, full bore into the world of serverless with the service mesh manager. I, True. Well, yeah, the, the misnomer is serverless doesn't require, you know, there's a lot of technology um, involved with serverless. And, you know, you still need your server, you still need the stack associated with that. A lot of times it could be a function, but it could be just a, a serverless component where, you know, all of that is brought up dynamically, whether it's on a hypervisor, on a container, and then torn down rapidly because it's no longer needed because it had to do a particular task. And, and, and that really now speaks to how dynamic and cloud scale we're talking about it. Humans can only do so much at it so fast. Now we need technology to do that, you know, automation, observability, and, you know, the things that we talked about that were guiding principles of what Intersight's all about. So serverless, absolutely part of our future. Awesome. And now here's a, here's a bonus question, either, either for you or for Zeus. Uh, I was out, you know, kind of scouting around reading. What is a chaos monkey? Can someone tell me what a chaos monkey is? And how does that relate here? See, so do you want to take it? I, I can absolutely chime in because I know, I know back to, um, you know, if you, you know, again, back to operations, right? This is the, the nirvana of what operations is really looking to strive to is you throw a monkey into a system, you have no idea what they're going to do. And, but cloud and the promises, it should just keep on ticking. It should be, you know, it should be like it never happened. So I should be able to fail scenarios. I should shut off servers. I should be able to, you know, spin up, tear down, and I should have the redundancy, the resiliency, the high availability. And I should be able to do that even if I throw a monkey into the wrench. So chaos monkey, yeah. I love. It. And you can do that with Service Mesh Manager, right? You can like introduce latency, or so you can chuck that monkey in and see what happens. That's awesome. Well, you get definitely can see it's what really, happens. It's really a method. Of, <laughs> it's really a method of. of of trying to understand what your uh, kind of known unknowns are, right? Like you, you kind of know what you know, but sometimes, you know, when you run an infrastructure, you don't know what you, what, what you don't know, and so you you do throw those monkeys and you know and the monkey, the monkeys and the, the gears and just to to see what happens, and then you can withstand, uh, try and understand how you withstand some of those uh, different scenarios and things like that. It's a it's sort of an interesting way to run operations, but it's become more and more common now. So, you know, if you look at GitHub and things like that, it's, uh, it's you know, uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's very wide to talk about there. All right, guys. Well, this monkey is delighted with how the last 47 minutes transpired and it went by in a flash. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, let me go around the horn, though, and thank you guys. Zeus, thank you so much for coming to Cisco Chat. Oh, thank you. This is great. It's an awesome topic. Awesome. And Vikas, thank you so much for telling us everything about X series. We've got a, actually, I'll plug our own webinar. We've got a webinar on June 15th. Um, everything you want to know about X series, we're going to go deep. And Vikas, you'll be a big part of that show. So, Vikas, thank you for joining here today. Absolutely. My pleasure, Tab. Thank you. And Matt, you, you, are, you are the tip of the spear for us, man. No pressure. Um, really exciting to see what we're doing around serverless and, and everything that we're doing with Service Mesh Manager, Cloud Orchestrator, Workload Engine, Intersight. Uh, just taking Cisco and, and, and definitely our computing business into a whole new space. So thank you so much for coming in and explaining it here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite, and hopefully I'll get that monkey off my back. All right. And the biggest thanks to our audience today. Folks, thanks for dialing and spending the time with us. Just uh, follow that Cisco chat hashtag out on Twitter, and you can see, you know, when the next show is going to be and, and, and come again. I think we're up here on the weekly. So appreciate the time. Thank you so much.